evening, everybody, and welcome to APL Public Lecture. My name is Simin Dawoodi, and I have the honor of introducing our evidence speaker, Professor Patsy Ruby, Professor Emeritus at APL, Newcastle University. Patsy graduated as a geographer in 1961 from UCL and received her doctoral degree in planning and geography in 1973 from LSC. After working as a teacher and a planner, Patsy taught at planning schools at Kingston Polytechnic and then Oxford Polytechnic before taking the chair in planning at Newcastle University in 1988. I'd like to pause on this date, 1988, <coughs> because it was a significant milestone, probably in Patsy's career, but most certainly in APL's history, and coincidentally, in my career too. For Patsy, it was the beginning of a long-term commitment to the planning school at Newcastle. She had ample opportunities to move to other academic institutions, but decided to stay put in the Northeast and wait the school, the APM. For the school, Patsy's arrival marked the beginning of a transformative process which made APL an internationally renowned planning school due largely to Patsy's leadership and contribution. And it just so happened that I had the privilege of becoming Patsy's first postgraduate student and later a research associate and ever since enjoyed being mentored, supported, and inspired by her. Of course, I am not the only one. I'm not the only one whose life has been touched by Patsy. There are numerous others who've been inspired by her intellect, as well as her integrity, generosity of spirit, and unique capacity to bring the best out of those who work with her. If I read all the awards and honors that Patsy has received, we'd be here all night. But let me just mention some of the highlights. In 1999, she was awarded an OBE for her services to plan. In 2004, she became honorary fellow of the Association of European Schools of Planning, of which she was the first female president. In 2006, she received the Royal Town Planning Institute's Gold Medal Award for her outstanding achievement in the field of town and country planning. Again, the first woman ever to receive the award in the 60-year history of the Institute of the award. In the same year, she was made a fellow of University College London, from which she graduated back in the 60s. And in 2009, she was awarded Ordinary Fellowship of the British Academy for distinction in urban planning theory and practice. Throughout her career, Patsy has advised various governments in the UK and internationally, while remaining deeply committed to the well-being of the communities around her. A clear indication of this is her tireless work as the chair and elected trustee of Glendale Gateway Trust. Internationally, Patsy is renowned for her work on planning theory and her ideas about strategic planning, strategic thinking, and placemaking. She's 
published numerous articles and books on a wide range of themes, notably socio-spatial dynamics, strategic planning, and urban governance. Her most celebrated book, Collaborative Planning, was published in 1997 and immediately became a classic in planning theory. The book has influenced intellectual debates beyond the planning discipline, and maybe more importantly, beyond the academy. The influence on practice isn't surprising at all, at least up to me, because although we know Patsy as a renowned planning theorist, she has always been profoundly engaged with and concerned about practice. Her research and scholarship has been grounded in what matters to people and places and what planning can offer to make better places. Tonight's lecture is not an exception. It's another indication of her commitment to an enthusiasm for the planning project. Max is going to talk about creating public value through place shaping, some reflections on planning ideas and practices. It gives me great pleasure and a real honor to welcome Professor Lee. Very much to me for those kind words. You know, you go through in life, and I shall, you probably got a sense of the age that I'm about to arrive at. You go through in life trying to do things that you really get interested in, that you care about, that you're passionately committed to. And it's a bit of a surprise when all of a sudden people start honouring you for doing what you really thought it was important to do. And I do hope all of you who care about planning will just carry on caring about it whatever the recognition you get, because I never expected any of this. So just, that's just by the way, of just really seem to belong to me somehow or other. Anyway, today I've been exploring this idea of the how, how the planning work, and I've explained that for me, planning is about place shaping, not just any kind of place shaping, but place shaping with a particular orientation, a particular set of values behind it. And I want to talk about particularly about the way the justification of that activity has for anything the justification of having public services and health for education because it creates public value, something for the wider public beyond individuals. So that's the direction I want to take. And through this, I want to kind of emphasize this public value having two <coughs> dimensions. One is public value in, I suppose, the way the world around us, the way places around us are, 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 are organised, what they look like, what they feel like, how they like to move through, etc. What the material benefits they give to us, us and the other people with whom we share that space. But it's also about creating something which people sometimes call a public sphere. A sphere of discussion about that environment. So it's both creating a, a so you could say an object around us, but also a sphere of discussion. And I'm very interested in these days, a number of people writing about the state of our politics and our democracy, saying we really need more attention to the nature of our public sphere. Now, I think that one of the things that, that, that I, I'm saying, I think in the present time in the UK, and many of you are probably not from the UK, we are having quite a lot of difficulty in getting the idea of shaping places to create public value in the public realm and the public sphere is going against a lot of other very dominant discourses which convert into practices. Other places, uh, the planning idea can flourish better. But one thing which is very evident to me in a number of fields of scientific endeavour, of social scientific endeavour, of practice, is that more and more people are saying it's the qualities of place make a difference to human flourishing. Qualities of place make a difference to the sustainability of the wider world in which we have to live. So although it's taking a hard time to get leverage in the broad and dominant discourses in which we're currently living, one of the things about being old 
is that you can see that it takes time, but the ideas of one generation flow through to the next. So perhaps my message is, get ready, you're going to be called on. And part of that political moment, you can begin to see, I, I'm, although it's going to, it's going to take a long time, finally, the idea that we need to decentralize seems to be getting, in, in our particular, uh, particularly the English political community, we've really got to decentralize and pull away from what has been an over-centralized state. How that will go, how that will play out, huge amount of experimentation, but we've got to be pushing into, into that dynamic. So what I'm going to do in this, this talk, I'm going to start off with some definitions. I'm called a planning theorist, and I suppose planning theorists have to make definitions about things. So I'm going to say something about this planning as place shaping, something about governance. Now, some people really hate this word governance, but actually, we, I'll explain, it's one of the, we can't detach this collective work of change, place shaping from governance. So I'll say something about planning as place shaping, something about governance, something about this complex word public. What on earth do we mean by, by that? And something about value. And then I'll have a little excursion, by the way, about how you might measure public value and different conceptions of that. But before I do that, I want to, I, I'll then embark on a little history about what the planning group, what, about looking back a hundred years, we're a hundred years of the RTBI now, and it will be, in January, 75 years of my years. That's my kind of celebratory moment. So we'll have a look at those two points, and then maybe have a look at some of the things that have happened since. And I'll end up saying, where are we now, but also, what can we do to re revitalize what our predecessors saw so clearly as the planning movement? And I think it's really interesting when you read the stuff that was written a hundred years ago. There was a very strong sense of belief in the project, of, of, of mobilizing people to argue that the politicians, the public, need to pay attention to this place shaping work. A lovely, uh, I think, famous day to Abercrombie say, well, when we start wanting to mold our environment. Um, Patrick Geddes, who's well worth reading again and again, actually. It's really interesting and inspiring. Talking not just about the environment we've got to provide, enough houses we've got to provide, enough jobs we've got, enough about streets, but he's talking about the spiritual ideas which should inform our place shaping. He's actually harking back to some very ancient Greek conceptions of the way in which the polis, the polity, was a, a, was a public sphere with a spiritual quality as well as a physical essence. And then John Burns, a politician who steered through, I think it's the 1909 Planning Act. Those of you who remember your planning history should, should bear in mind that act. And he was very concerned with the domestic condition. He was particularly interested in housing. Physical health, moral health, character, etc. And then we come to uh, the, the politician who wrote the forward to the National Planning Policy Framework. And there it is. All of these definitions, as I've suggested, did not really preoccupy people terribly much. <clears throat> now, a hundred years ago, well, what, what, what was being offered by this energetic planning movement? How did people understand place governments? It was partly about transforming places, and the model of Hausmann's Paris actually went around the world. You can see it turning up in places in the Middle East and in various other, and, and in, in uh, parts of Latin America. If you wanted to see how could you make a grand city, you looked at the Parisian examples. But that wasn't the only idea. In the UK and other parts of, of Europe as well, there was very strong concern, articulated by John Burns in my earlier uh, slide, was that it was about housing for ordinary people. And Patrick Geddes is very clear. He, he saw this as, as the burghers, the burghers, the citizens, versus the, the grand projects ideas. And he was very much on the side of the ordinary people, or the burghers, the citizens. And, but in addition to thinking of, of those things, there was a very strong belief that somehow or other you could create this better world, more livable, more sustainable, though they didn't use quite those, vocab those vocabularies, but you could, you could create this uh, by, by working on not just buildings, but you could also uh, create lifestyles. So they wanted to shape people's lifestyles. And one of the things that's really, sometimes it's a bit disturbing, as you realise what they, what people of those types thought you could actually do. Very paternalistic. 
They also, very, very strong belief, which is very, the beginning of the 19th of the 20th century, very strong belief that the future was unfolding in a progressive way in which everybody could share in material benefits. And in some ways, it did actually do that, except that everybody was in the Western world and the other parts have taken uh, are now struggling to get their share in this, in this, this idea. Very much a linear development project. But one of the things that, that uh, well, history may not be as good as it should be, one of the things that quite strikes me about the discussions at that time, it was very much concerned with bits of city. They were, they were tra transforming existing parts of cities, adding on new bits of cities. So who was, who was the public in all of this? Well, there was not a, although there was, perhaps there was a, a sense that there was a coherent view of what the public was, for some, the public was actually, or the people, maybe wasn't concerned for the public, but the public would be benefited by what the elites and the monarchs did. And therefore, the planners who are, uh, Houseman, for example, was accountable to uh, the Emperor Napoleon III, who was trying to, to develop his city. And, and, and many dictators thought this was a very good idea too, as they tried to ornament their cities. But then the other dimension was very much, well, you've got elites, you've got others who are trying to build what the citizenry understood as a mass. There was also quite a bit of concern about how to make the land development industry work more effectively. And particularly in German zoning, it develops because of trying to coordinate infrastructure with the allocation of plots. And that also turns out interesting in the US. And the values, if you go down the monarchial route, prestige and status, but also better living conditions and better investment. Well, now I need to come to, to, to my origins, because I was kind of born I was born into uh, a world which was actually at that time at war. Very interestingly, it's often said the best example of a completely nationally planned society was Britain in the wartime. Uh, some of that, el those elements you could find in, say, in, in the Netherlands and in Germany and some of the other wartime regimes, but because of this wartime experience, it was holding everything together. And a lot of very much dominated by all the technocrats and experts who weren't fighting in the war, they were busily working out how to how to, to organise the government or organise the, the, the delivery of armaments and food and whatever it was to the society, but also uh, thinking about the future. And this thinking about the future is an, that was going on in a number of different countries across Europe. How can we build a better future when there's no longer war? Because I, I think when we come to, when you may arrive at the 100 year story of the First Second World War, but I don't think I shall. So at that time, I think it would be very interesting to see how, how strongly people were feeling we must live differently after the war. But in the planning field, one of the things which had been evolving prior to that was a concern that we mustn't pay just attention to the bits and the parts, but we need to take a more comprehensive view, a more regional view, a holistic view. We need to move away from adapting bits of city to thinking about how, how places could evolve through time. And it was a period of some very famous plans, and the ones I put up here, the Greater London Plan, um, and also the famous 1935 plan for Amsterdam, um, which had been a social democratic city since, since I think 1922, and has remained it until about now. And some changes are now going on, but a very, very interesting example of a continuity of a strong, popularly supported planning orientation to see what does it deliver in terms of city quality. But behind this notion of, a, of an overview, of a theme of how a place is strategically developing, there was also something which I know Samina's written about, about the importance of a synthetic imagination, being able to integrate different dimensions to get to encapsulate how cities would develop. Very much concerned with much more univers universalistic uh, set of, of values so which apply to everybody. And but with the assumption that the public sector, this is very important, the public sector was going to be the main actor, which it was in the UK for a very brief period, but soon stopped. But in the Netherlands and Sweden, and to some extent some of the other Scandinavian countries, the public sector remained a strong actor for a very long time. So what were these um, conceptions, what was offered, were particularly plans and redevelopment projects. There wasn't much discussion about a detailed management at that time, nor 100 years previously. What have we got? A generalised conception of, of, of the good city, 
a generalized conception of a mass citizen group. So everybody was kind of to be, was thought about as being in the same boat, which you can see is kind of her inheritance over from, from a wartime view that we're, we're a, a nation of war in, uh, in, in, our, in face of particular difficulties. And it was assumed that politicians, officials, and experts could define the public interest. And that was the context in which we got our 1947 Development Act. Now, I think there are very many things that should change in the way in the UK our planning system is organised, but I do not think we should change the fundamentals of the 1947 Act. Now, that's a, anybody who knows about the Act will know that it has certain distinctive qualities, and we may go on to that in question time, but those distinctive qualities, people were astonished and jealous about that when they come to the time. Well, what values, and I've got my little picture of the nuclear family, because you can find all kinds of things when you look at Google Images, but it's certainly clear that in the minds of people, <clears throat> this generalised view of the mass citizenry were organised as nuclear families to whom the provider state was going to, to organise a, a coordinated environment with an efficient public interest uh, administration informed by scientific and technical expertise. But there's also this very strong dreaming of a better future. When I think about it, and read a bit, try, uh, I have various times read some of the histories of that period and looked at some of the documentation. Somehow, back in the 100 years ago, there was this very strong sense of an evangelical movement. We've got to go out there and change things. We've got to change the minds of politicians. We've got to really move forward. Somehow or other, by the time we get to the 20, 75 years ago, it's all about now we've got to institutionalise this system. We've got to create a system and institutionalise it. Some of the kind of evangelism, despite the Planners were called evangelistic bureaucrats, and there's a famous book for that. But somehow the evangelism is a little bit squeezed out as we got into, we've got to make this system work. <laughs> so, well, that takes us 100 years ago, 75 year, years ago. Since then, and during all my, my lifetime of a career involved in planning, I think we could say the belief in planning has systematically unraveled. Talking with my friend Judy Innes in the US, as she is saying, ah, we're trying to write something generally about what's happening in Europe and North America, and it's virtually impossible, because the North American story is actually very different. But their belief in planning was unravelling very early on, and they hardly, hardly managed to get it lodged in, for all kinds of uh, political and, and also cultural reasons. But in the UK, we perhaps carried on with quite a strong belief until we got to the late 60s, when the economy got into difficulties. <clears throat> but we also, where was this unravelling coming from? Well, let's have a look was coming from the left. The left, we said, these paternalist, bureaucratic agencies are oppressing citizens who are really wanting to do something different. They were particularly protesting, as I think you may know, about grand schemes to demolish slums and rebuild in a different way of uh, uh, transport projects which drove through different, uh, different uh, parts of cities and people saw their environments changing. Not surprisingly, people objected. So if any of you are coming from countries where retrofitting is going to be a tremendous challenge, watch out. It's going to be a, a conflictual process. <clears throat> but uh, also, we were getting uh, challenges from the right, and that was perhaps building up during the 1970s, which was saying we don't want all this government, we don't want all this public sector activity. And planning very strongly got uh, uh, associated with, with, uh, <clears throat> with, with state-led development, and also, I'm, I'm thinking of the 1980s when I was doing some interviewing in local, I forget which, was one of, the, one of the Southeast District Councils, and they said, planning is a socialist plot, Mrs. Thatcher has told us so. <laughs> and so that was, we were quite good to see just how, how, and how sort of duality was appearing. But I also think, and that takes us back to the role of ourselves, including myself, as an academic. If you look at academia, what were we doing in academia? We were being intensely critical of the planning inheritance that we got from the 50s and 60s. We weren't looking at what were some of the important things that we should be carrying forward. We were saying all the things that went wrong. I mean, we followed that through with all the initiatives. We're extremely good as academics at evaluating, saying that's not working, that's wrong, that's unjust, that's unfair. It's not wrong to do that, but also you've got to build around, so how could you do it better? better? And doing it better is not some ideal world. It's a terribly messy thing, doing better. Doing better is a continuous struggle for something a little bit better than what you could do before. And if I look at some of the academic literature these days, I see where we really get quite
quite cynical. And in a way, that's one of the things I'm trying to counteract, to say we cannot afford to be cynical. We need to be critical, constructive, and get back onto them. But there's something in this movement that's important, and we shouldn't lose it. And by the time we got to the 1980s, of course, we were in the deep, I think as you read all the history, people say the 1980s was when neoliberalism got going, and in Britain was the, was the first experiment, and the most extreme experiment. And it's quite useful to think that, well, we did go through that, and it was quite extreme. But, some, but in that context, some very fine, for, for the emphasis was, particularly, forget about plans, think about projects, projects as defined by the market, reduce your regulation to the minimum, and follow according to market principles. So the market was being celebrated, and individual initiative was being celebrated, as we still, to some extent, do. And famously, the two pictures, well, hopefully you recognise them, Canary Hall, rather lovely picture, actually, and, and uh, the Metro Centre, Newcastle Metro Centre. But in 1980, it was Michael Hesitine who introduced to say, when you're thinking about allocating sites and plans for which the, 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 the requirement, they were procedurally required, local authorities were procedurally required to produce plans, you actually have to provide land, but you must do it according to the way developers advise you as to what is marketable. Now, anything who knows anything about the development industry will know that the, the, the industry is, A, not absolutely clear what people want, they know what they can make money on top of is the market. And also, they're very good at saying, well, what we want is for everybody else to be constrained so we can do what we want. And I think that's, that, that kind of getting underneath that rhetoric is a very challenging issue. But my favourite quote, which I, I, I actually haven't checked the actual text, <coughs> but this is a circular about the planning was about development and employment, and planning permission should be given. People say, oh, the, 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 the latest statement says planning permission will be given, whereas it should be only given if such and such, some people like to say, only given if it really fits into our plan. As this said, planning permission should be given unless it result to acknowledge interests. I had to say, I know the person who wrote it, and I when he wrote it, I said, how would you write this? Who do you think? How are you going to demonstrate how? And who are these acknowledged, important, interesting, acknowledged importance? And he said, he resurrected it from some, some material from the 1940s. So very interesting how, how central government actually works. You, uh, Samin did say I had occasionally worked with central government. So you do get to know these things. Well, where are we now? And I bet we will be moving on to the third part before long. Right, oh, oh, I think it's quite clear the conceptus of the public very much about the, the vocal and a strong emphasis in this uh, we've had since the 1980s on financial issues and economic growth and the capacity of markets, moderated by our awareness that there are multiple growing awareness in the literature, in uh, discussions in various arenas but there are also multiple publics and situation people have very diverse values. Where are we now, are we now? One of the things that's very striking is all through this time, despite the difficulties, the capacity of the planning community to deliver good quality uh, development management, to deliver good quality plans, perhaps less so, and put good quality urban design and good quality places has not uh, disappeared. In fact, it's expanded. For me, the Netherlands is very interesting because they didn't have that 1980s experience. They're beginning to have a bit of it now. But they, they carried on the ideas that we've been developing in a more continuous way due to some fine environments. So we should remember that place governments, they, although the arrival has continued, place governments has produced some, some really uh, successful places and some good, good ideas about projects, about plans or frameworks and development management. But also, because the planning field emphasises relations and connections, how things are connected together, how things fit together, how things could be integrated in particular sorts of places, how material things and mental concerns and people's value concerns interlink. Um, it's still, uh, it, it's very difficult to be appreciated in a, new, in a world where individualistic new public management practices are evolving. Nevertheless, as I was saying earlier, people do care about places and their qualities. They are concerned about how they live, how we share spaces with others. So, um, so I think uh, that so, so they're using these arenas of the planning system 
to push uh, other different ideas forward. Now, I'm going to jump over the, the, the last next two slides. Um, I think the, the reasons we know that planning is continuously criticised, but much of the critique of planning is because of the wider public sphere, the debates in the wider public sphere, and the stereotypes that are floating around in that public sphere. Now that comes back to, 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 my, to thinking about my, 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 how I want to end up, that we really need to go back to those 100 years ago, that idea that, that there was a movement there pushing forward, the idea of, of place shaping through in this planning way, in a way to, uh, which would continue, continue, contrib contribute to human flourishing. So I think there's also an opportunity, as I said earlier on, <clears throat> and there's also, I'm, I'm astonished just how many people are writing to say, we've got to do something about our public sphere. Now in that context, it's really interesting that the work of caring for place qualities is an arena where we're all the time injecting things into the public sphere. So the way in which we do planning work, when we do place shaping work, wherever we do it, it actually matters for the qualities of the wider public sphere, which is shaping our democracy. Now, some time ago, I, I put down my own set of what I thought were the key terms. So in the public sphere, we can learn how to do it. And I think through that, can we somehow or other uh, uh, recover a sense of place shaping as a civic project, a collective activity? of, sh of uh, shaping, uh, of caring for place qualities. Building a public sphere, creating a ground, and this goes back to my discussion of Dewey, creating publics where we find it easier to create a political ground for making complex valid choices. We, all of us, in all our daily life, make complex valid choices. People understand that you have to make complex valid choices. But when we come into the political sphere, we suddenly are making extreme stereotypical dualistic choices. So it's either this or that. And nearly always in planning work, it's not either this or that, but a complex mix of various things which we can just try to search after if we can. Enriching the public sphere, creating publics, recognizing how many of them there like to be, connecting grass roots and grass stops, and also valuing. Um, I'm told that journalists are at the bottom of the heap of public value, and just above them are politicians. But above them are probably officials. And I really think, although I've been quite critical of our political sphere, we, have, we need in our society to have politicians and we need to have uh, officials. So we've got to find a way of valuing people who do politics, and perhaps encouraging more people to go into politics. Maybe some of you are going to go into politics and try to make a difference that way even though it doesn't sound very attractive sometimes when you look at what you have to do. And uh, I can't go into how we create a pragmatic orientation. That's a, another interesting one, but I'll come back to, maybe come back to that on another future occasion. So if I want to summarise then, what's the contribution of the planning community? Uh, what's going to be the contribution of the planning community to creating a movement for creating public value? This is my normative statement. We can help to build the general <coughs> values in our community. Wherever we go, whatever we're at, we can help to work on that. Building what some people are calling the moral compass of our political communities, the things that we can share. It sounds awfully big and brave, but if we don't do that, where on earth are we going to be going next as a, as in the political communities in which we live? And I put down things that the people do care about, about not just human flourishing for themselves, but for others, for environmental care. I'm not putting economic growth. I think the answer I'd say material availability, economic health, whether that means growth, I think you might just really need to be careful to think about that. Capacity for evolutionary learning and adaptability and inclusive democratic engagement, which does not mean everybody has to engage, but people have to say, think, well, I've got my rights, and I've also got my responsibilities, which is to give respect, to pay attention, to try to contribute if I can. When that's needed. And then we've got lots of values, and maybe you can all go away and write, have discussions about what you really think are the bad core values that are planning in our planning movement. We should, as a, as a community of people who know a lot about place shaping, and we know a lot about place shaping in complex political contexts in our kind of societies, what are the values which we think are really important? <laughs> Livability, sustainability, for, for the many, Fairness and social justice for me links into that. 
paying attention to the quality of design. I've been converted. I have to say, I was very critical of urban design in, my, in the 1960s and 1970s. I pulled right back from that, thanks to the excellent uh, model uh, urban designers who have helped to teach me through the years, including the ones in our own school here. Paying attention to connecting parts of what's going on in parts with holes, and that synthetic integrative imagination, and encouraging discussion and debate. I was really hammered years ago in collaborative planning for suggesting that it would be a good thing if we promoted much more public debate. Uh, I, I now will stand by that. I may make some criticisms about the way I was discussing it back then, <clears throat> back then, but I have no doubt that we have to improve the quality of debates we can have about any kind of changes to our place environment. Otherwise, there will be now the classic of legitimacy to carry forward uh, uh, things that collectivities need to do in society. Well, that's, my, uh, that's getting towards my trying to create a manifesto. Let's go back a hundred years to a voice for the past. And he was writing, Patrick Eddis, in 1915. And he must have been writing in 1914. And we're all hearing a lot about the situation in 1914. So he's saying, we must help the next generation, so he's thinking generationally, apply its best minds, a bit paternalistic, I would say, all our minds, the best minds by all our minds to rethink, resynthesize our problems and to reconstruct the tasks we do and where we do things. I think, that's, I think that's what I feel we really need to be thinking about today. And to help in doing that, to developing more concrete visions, opening possibilities, opening potentials for social betterment and uplift. You perhaps have a slightly less archaic way of saying that, but that's not a bad way. An uplift doesn't mean We've got to have more material goods. It means uplifting human flourishing. That's what he had in mind. And then he says, day by day, in the little things, year by year, generation by generation. And then he says, place, work, and folk together. That's the integrative idea. So I think maybe Patrick Dennis was a better manifesto statement than anybody who's come since. Well, I'll try. Thank you very much indeed.